please join me in welcoming Steve James to the stage. Thank you, Teresa. Um, so we're just going to have um, just a couple questions and set up the screening, and then um, Steve has generously offered to come back for a Q&A where we can talk about the film and documentary filmmaking. So um, I wanted to just ask you a question before the screening that with documentary uh, filmmaking, we often hear terms like direct cinema and cinema verite, uh, films and filmmakers that use a camera to bear witness or ones that uh, use cameras to revoke or incite action. So critics, scholars, and programmers often refer to your films as observational or portrait films. And I was wondering if you could set up for the audience today the, your relationship to your filmic subjects or social actors uh, and the role of the camera in documentary. Um, yeah, I think I'm in that tradition. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm not a pure verite filmmaker like uh, Frederick Wiseman or some of the great verite classics, you know, that were made in, in particularly in the 70s, I think, and starting in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, meaning I don't just um, go and not interact with subjects or not interview subjects. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I like talking to the subjects. I like to get to know them, and I think part of... Um, part of the appeal of making the documentaries is to form some kind of relationship with the, the main subjects, which I think contributes to uh, a couple of things for me anyway. One is it's more fun. Uh, you know, it's more, it's more like a human relationship instead of like filmmaker subject. Um, secondly, I, I'm always really curious about what's going on in their heads and what they're thinking and, and, and wanting them to reflect on who they are and what they, what, where their life has taken them and where it's going. And you can't necessarily get that without talking to them. And so why not talk to them on camera? So, so my films really kind of mix a number of, pull from different influences in, in that way. And I, and, uh, and I think there, there's sort of fundamentally two approaches to um, observational cinema in the contemporary world. One, one is to be more that fly on the wall where you you try to um, disappear, um, and of course, there's lots of critical writings and thought about that as to whether that's bogus or not, or achievable or not. I don't even, I, you know, I don't even want to have that discussion. I, I don't, I, I, I want to get to a place where I can capture people's lives in an honest way through demystifying the whole process, um, through having them be comfortable with the camera, be comfortable with me and my crew. Uh, and and get there that way instead of trying to disappear. And, and so you you speak about this the uh, participants being comfortable with the camera. Uh, could you maybe set up this film and and maybe even talk about how long you were with them? <laughs> yeah. Well, this film you know this film is a good example of all this because it um, it you know it, it it took seven and a half years to make. Uh, we shot for about four and a half. Um, and, you know, if, as this building of a relationship is something you see, I think if you have this in your mind as you watch the film today, I think you will, you will see that kind of happen in a, in a way. Um, uh, you know, the first part of the film is much more driven by interviews um, than by scenes. We, I mean, we have some key scenes early, but it's mostly a film driven by interviews. And in fact... Um, in the first, partly out of lack of funding, uh, a big part of it, and partly out of building relationships. In the first two years that we filmed this, we shot a total of 25 days. And I'm telling you this so that if you haven't seen the film, um, when you get to the end of sophomore year, it's broken into, the film is divided into years. When you get to the end of sophomore year of high school, you may think you're halfway done with the movie. You're only 40 minutes into the movie. <laughs> you still got a long way to go. Um, and that's reflected in the fact that we didn't shoot as much. We couldn't shoot as much. And that bu building of that relationship, um, in this case, also took more time, uh, a little bit more time. And there were certain markers, and we can talk about it maybe after the movie, where um, that relationship deepened. And then, so then in junior year, we shot 40 some days, 45 days in junior year alone. In the summer before and in senior year, and then a little bit of them, just a very little bit of them in college, uh, we shot 100 days. And so 
And if you watch the movie, you will sort of see that reflected in the movie. That's the movie, the, the years expand as we go along and it becomes more intimate and it becomes more scene driven, so. And then 10 years later, they do a voiceover commentary <laughs> for your DVD, which is just, it's amazing, the layers and this duration, right? So, yeah. so how many years in total from when you met them? To uh, now? To, yeah. Oh, well, we started the film back in 87, so. Uh, it's almost 25 years, 24 years. 25 ago. years. Yeah. It's amazing. So uh, please enjoy the film on a big screen, film print on a big screen, and we will return uh, for question and answers afterwards. Thank you. Thanks. Everyone, help me welcome Steve James back up to the stage. Thank you. Um, so I'll just start off with a couple questions and then we're gonna open it up to you to ask questions. Um, so before the screening, we talked about the relationship with the, your relationship with your, the filmmaker, uh, your relationship as a filmmaker uh, to the actors, to the, to the subjects. Um, in, I, I, you know, I'm a bit of a nerd, so I did research. In the Kurtemkin trailer that's part of the DVD materials of his fantastic 2008 documentary at the Death House Door, you state, by taking you into someone's life, we can understand not just them, but some larger social issues. Now, this film, you know, is at once about basketball, but about education, about class, about so many other issues, about race, and um, in media coverage, and also at the Death House Doors, it's, it's about um, uh, uh, capital punishment, but like it's about following the individual a chaplain, but it's also about capital punishment, about law, about justice. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about how you structure your film so that it's, you know, you're taking, you're following someone's life, but it's also opening the world up to so many other larger social issues? Yes, I, you know, I fell in love with um, movies, you know, capital M movies, like a lot of people do. Um, although these days, because of the prominence of documentaries in the culture, I think there are actually people who fall in love with film through documentaries. But when I, I'm older, as you may have noticed, but I, you know, like a lot of my peers, like I wanted to make movies, and I found my way to making documentaries. And I think that... Um, so I ended up wanting to make documentaries that were stories, uh, and and I and I found myself fascinated with this idea, certainly starting with this film and and in some subsequent films I've made, of following stories, following people's lives at at, at oftentimes at critical junctures or or at important places in their life, and it's inherently dramatic and dramatic, you know, and and potentially interesting. And, but I find that the stories, you know, I didn't really necessarily realize this. It's just I'm interested in that story. I was interested in, you know, kids wanting to use basketball to do something to escape or whatever. Um, in a series like The New Americans, I was interested in what it was like for immigrants to come to America and see what, see what they were like before they were immigrants and then see what, how coming here changed them. So my interest is always starts with more like that would be a really interesting story to tell but I find that the things that the stories that interest me always tend to have larger Im implications in terms of um, you know social realities and and uh, economic realities or whatever. And so for me, it's more about if you just tell the story in a very close up and intimate way, but with an awareness of these other things that there, there, there are sort of organic ways in which they will emerge, especially if you're following people over time because opportunities will present themselves or things will happen to them that just echo those economic or socio-economic realities. And now there's a lot of uh, production students in here, so you're talking about the organic kind of process. Did, did, is that how it, you went from you know, story editor to you know, filmmaker, story editor, and, and also editor as well, because you found that it just organically, okay, now I know how to cut this together. Yeah, I, um, I love editing. I mean, um, you know, I think you start out with a, uh, more, maybe more on that in a second, but I think you, you, you start out with an idea, and if you, read, if you read the early proposals for Hoop Dreams when we were trying to get funding and not having much luck with it, it's not like we were unaware of the social realities of the story, you know. Um, they're, they're in the description of the film we want to tell, but 
but it's a, it's compared to the film we made, it, they're very thre threadbare and obvious and simple-minded. <laughs> you know, the the film we made had much more, I think, interesting complexities and and um, in just following their lives. And because you know the 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 guys that made this film, we all loved basketball, and it all played basketball on some level. Um, we didn't we didn't look at this as a story that was just going to be a diatribe against the business of basketball. We looked at it in a more complicated way because we felt like that was more honest. And so when you get into the, so you, you make all these discoveries while you're filming that, that really open your eyes to the complexity. And then when you get to editing, I think, then that's your opportunity to really fully tell the story. And we went through a lot of struggles early on in the editing to try and figure out how to tell both these kids' stories simultaneously. And one of the initial passages, we just bounced back and forth, almost like if you took a chronology of everything we shot. It was like that was scene one, scene two, scene three, scene four. And it had no story. I mean, it had no sweep, it had no, it, it, it just, it just seemed like this happened and that happened and this happened and that happened. And it wore you down. It was about six hours long. You know, by the time you got to hour five, you were sort of into it because you didn't have any choice. But um, it, just, it really didn't work. And it wasn't until we made some realizations about we need, to in, we need to invest you as an audience into each of these stories of these kids over ch some significant chunks so that you get invested in their lives. Then we go to the next kid and we do the same thing with him. And so that every time we're coming back, you're like, oh, oh, okay, what's going on now with them? And it also presented all these great opportunities for where the point of view of the film emerges. Because, you know, I think the film clearly has a point of view, but it's not a polemical point of view. It's not a Michael Moore kind of point of view. But it's those junctures that create those opportunities between stories or between scenes in any film for that kind of point of view to emerge. I'll give you an example. Like when Arthur's power gets turned off, um, there's, you know, um, they have no power, they have no money. It's a pretty, you know, low point for the family. The very next scene you see, we go back to William's story, and William is getting an MRI done on his knee. He's suffering his own misfortune, but it's a different kind of misfortune. He's got all the resources of St. Joe's and all the power, literally electricity and everything in support of trying to figure out what's wrong with his knee, a much different kind of problem than the problem the Ages are going through. And there's a, there's a moment later in the film where Sheila gets her um, nursing assistance degree and you, the last shot is you see hardly anyone is there to see it. The very next shot is a basketball game for Arthur where, the, where the, the gym is packed to see him play and his team play. So those were kind of moments, you know, we like to think of them as somewhat subtle, but those are moments where, where points of view, I think, emerge. And so editing becomes this great opportunity for the real storytelling, much like in narrative film, the storytelling, a lot of the storytelling happens at the script level and then to, to a degree in the filming, depending on the filmmaker, but in documentary, the real storytelling doesn't really happen until you get to the editing. That was a long, rambling answer, wasn't it? No, it was. <laughs> you took us on many paths. It was good. <laughs> uh, which then leads to marketing, distribution, exhibition, and the stories being told. There are two separate trailers for this film, <laughs> and there's also a music video for Hoop Dreams. I, I think we were the first documentary to have our own theme song. I think there were a lot of firsts with this film that are not known. One is, I think it was the first film originated on video to play theatrically in, in any substantive way. Yeah, and could you tell this audience a little bit about that and why, you know, it was, it was we, huge. It, it shot on video. We shot on video because we couldn't raise enough money to shoot on film. I was a film guy. My colleagues were film guys. We wanted to shoot film, but we just couldn't raise the money. But at that time, um, the only documentaries that appeared in theaters were shot on 16 millimeter film, to my knowledge. And so this was unusual, to say the least, that that happened. And then we, we hired a composer to do music for us, and he, we didn't ask him to come up with a theme song for the film that said Hoop Dreams, but he just did. And we were like, oh, that's kind of cool. So 
we put it in, um, but I think it was, uh, I think it's, uh, I, I don't know if there's any other documentary prior to that, maybe not since too, because maybe it was a bad idea, but that, that actually <laughs> did that. But then when we got the film completed and it was bought for theatrical distribution by Fine Line, they did two trailers, which we came to refer to as the, um, and I think on the Criterion Collection, it's even called this way. It's like the white trailer and the black trailer or something. There. Um, yeah, it's pretty much, it's like click here. Yeah, you know. click here for the, and the, the African American trailer was rap music, very fast cut, exciting, thrilling, lots of dunks, text flying in and out. Bright colors. Bright colors. And then the text, then the, the trailer for the regular art house crowd, i.e. white people, was swelling music, sentimental syrupy music, and fan, people hugging each other. and That coach personality that's like, you gotta make something with your life, it's yeah, America. And it's emotional and... Yeah. And they, you know, it, we thought that was pretty hilarious. It's, uh, but that's another thing, you know, the power of editing. You want that lesson. Look at the DVD commentary and see how these two are, you know, see if it's on YouTube, the two DVD, the two trailers. Completely different looks and feels, and, you know, completely different pacing, completely, you know, seemingly different film. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like we should open this up to the audience and see if you have any questions for Steve. Um, yep, so if you can just wait until we hand you the microphone right here. Yep, you, Plaid. Um, I was just wondering how many uh, kids you initially started off with uh, looking at? Two. Only the two? <laughs> and, okay, how did you choose them specifically? Well, we did, we, we looked at a couple other kids that we were interested in following. Um, one was uh, on a contemporary of theirs uh, on the team you know, who was who? Once we, um, once we had, uh, uh, we had met the kid's father, who who had kind of was advised us about a few things, and his son was going to go out to St. Joe's, as it turned out. And we looked at him, not really. He wasn't one that we thought for sure, um, but we looked at him at least. But the one kid that we really actively pursued was a kid whose brother was in the pros and another brother was in college it, it was a total basketball family from you know and they had a, a house full of trophies and this young kid had just been named the top eighth grader in the nation and um but his dad turned down the opportunity to follow him his rationale was that he didn't want to put added pressure on his son but um your son doesn't get to be listed in Sports Illustrated as a top eighth grader if you don't want it to happen. So it was it was kind of an odd uh, thing. That kid would have been a very interesting kid. He never he never made it at all. In fact, he went from high school to high school because he was never happy. You know, it would have been an interesting story. But we discovered Arthur like you see it in the film with Earl. We were out looking at courts. The original idea for the film was to focus on a single court not do this um, and sort of see some young dreamers and maybe some older players who'd come and been, you know, not succeeded like a Curtis and maybe a pro like an Isaiah Thomas who came from that court. And when we were out looking at courts, he s discovered Arthur and we were so fascinated with him, like seeing all this in this little kid and what he had in mind for him that we just said, wow, this is interesting. So we started filming that. And then that took us to St. Joe's and um, when Coach Pingator, as you see in the film, said, uh, you know, Arthur's a raw talent, but I've got this, you know, I've got this uh, other kid coming in who's amazing. We were like, well, let's meet him. And our original thought was, well, we'll f try to follow both of them. We had no money, so we were, we'll try to follow both of them, and maybe one of them will be interesting. So. Next question. Back row. Back row. You're hiding in the dark. Um... I was doing some research, and originally I found out the movie was supposed to be 30 minutes. What made you change it to make the movie longer? Yeah, well, so it was going to be 30 minutes when it was going to be focused on a single playground. And, and it's not like I thought 30 minutes was the ideal length. I just I was trying to be practical about what we could pull off because we were going to shoot it on film. And I know how expensive film was because I went to film school. And so we just thought, well, you know, because I was just trying to make something... Uh, I mean, I'm just trying to get something made. And um, and so, uh, even if we had made that film, I'm sure it would have turned out longer, the, the original idea, no question. Um, but what happened was, is that once we met Arthur, and 
once Big Earl said, I'm going to take you out to St. Joe's, I, it, everything aligned here. I had met Coach Pingator before any of that because when we were looking for playgrounds, we were looking for a playground where Isaiah played because he was a big star at the time. So I met Pingator, and he's, and he's the one that introduced me to Big Earl. He said, you know, I got the perfect guy. This guy knows every playground in the city. He's the guy you should go out with. So when Earl then decided to recruit Arthur to go out to St. Joe's, it was great because we already had a relationship with Pingator, not a big one, but, and so he was receptive. And when he sat there in that meeting and said, you know, uh, this may sound like I just watched the movie, but there's certain things I just haven't forgotten. I haven't watched the movie since the, the, the Criterion DVD commentary, I want to say. I don't go home and watch the movie a lot. But, he, you know, when, when, <laughs> when Pingator says to him, if you work hard at the grades and if you work hard at basketball, uh, in four years, I'll help you go to college. We just thought, what an extraordinary promise to make to this kid he literally just met and watched play um, for a little while. And it, that planted the seed right then of what would it be, what, what if it were possible, what would it, would it be interesting to see what happens to a kid like Arthur and then William over that time, period of time. And it was more of fantasy at the beginning because we had no money, but we eventually made it, made it happen. But... So instead of staying on a playground court, we decided to change the concept almost immediately to follow kids leaving the playgrounds to try and make their dream happen. Um, yeah. Hello. I liked your movie. I really like basketball, so this All was right. the greatest three hours of my life. <laughs> Anyways, um, we, wanted, oh, <laughs> um, we wanted to know if you knew what ever happened to Arthur and or William. Uh, no, I haven't talked to those guys in years. Uh, no. Um, uh, <laughs> There, um, I, I'm going to keep it short because uh, there's a whole long version of this, which you know, um, just so that we get more questions about filmmaking, I think. But uh, um, yeah, Arthur is, uh, you know, he's still hanging in there. He he tried to play semi-pro ball for a while. That didn't work out. He um, uh, he's had various jobs. He started a little uh, Arthur A.G. role model foundation uh, organization with his dad that um, he, you know, uses to go around and speak to kids. Um, he's tried for years to launch a, a, a Hoop Dreams clothing line with our blessing. Uh, I don't know that it's going to work out. It's been, he's been working at it for quite some time, and I, I think the moment's passed, frankly. But um, the tragic part of the story is, is that Bo, Arthur's dad, was murdered in 2006. Um, he... he um, he used to sell clothes out of the back of his uh, Oldsmobile to supplement income. Uh, he would sell designer label clothing and um, all over the city. He also had a, uh, a little church around the corner from where the family used to live. Uh, they now live in the suburbs, um, uh, or did live in the suburbs at that time. Um, um, and, uh, and somebody called him up and met him and killed him. Uh, so that really had a devastating impact on family, on Arthur, uh, caused Sheila to move back to Alabama. She took Tony, Arthur's older, uh, sister with her, but you know, th things have stabilized again, uh, since then with William, um, William ended up getting a degree from Marquette after leaving and not getting a degree and then going back and deciding he needed his degree. Um, he married Catherine, as you see in the film. They're still married. They have four children now. He has three boys, along with Alicia. Alicia graduated about a year ago, and she um, works as a dental hygienist. Um, he's, his three boys love basketball and want to be basketball players. Um, uh, Catherine's finishing up after fits and starts because of raising kids and family. She's finishing up a degree herself now. Uh, and tragedy befell that family as well. In 2001, uh, Curtis was murdered, um, which caused William and, uh, you know, to go through a very difficult time and his family. He eventually came out of that and um, found faith, and he's been a preacher and run an after school program now for a number of years. So. Okay, yep, yeah, back there. Oh, where is that? Um, I just had a, well, I had a question about, um, I, I think uh, I was interested in um, Big Earl's, uh, I guess, official role and how, 
what his work and how he might have been compensated? Because I, I, he kind of skirted around the question. And also, uh, do you see uh, Hoop Dreams as a, Im having an impact on other documentaries uh, being made in the same fashion around basketball, and especially at the collegiate level, um, looking at, uh, I guess, like Fab Five and stuff right. like that? Well, Earl, Earl worked as an insurance salesman. That's, what, that's where he got, that's how he earned his living. I think this was more of a hobby. I can't say conclusively whether coaches slipped him some money when, they, when he brought a good re recruit to them or whatever. I don't know. Um, I do think Earl is a pretty, I, I really like Earl and think he's a, he, he actually was, um, you know, trying to do the right thing by the kids that he, he uh, you know, he, he recruited. Um, he, there, there are many street agents out there in this world that that do some of what Earl was doing that are you know far less honorable than Earl. I can say that for sure, for a fact. Um, the impact of hoop dreams. I mean, I you know it's probably something to ask somebody else than me. I I, I mean I think that certainly there's been uh, more interest in doing sports films and sports documentaries that I'm sure was prompted in part by hoop dreams. Um, I've seen a number of the basketball films. There's a, there's a lot of really good ones out there, you know. Um, a lot of uh, I haven't seen the the LeBron James one though. I want to see that. I haven't seen that one, but you know, certainly there's been a lot of good films made. Well, and it also changed uh, how the Academy Awards nomination process for documentary. Um, when you were snub, the film was snubbed. It was supposed to, you know, there was anticipation that it would be nominated for Best Picture, and it was snubbed for even for the documentary, and then it created this whole uproar and this amazing opportunity for theatrical. Yeah, I think it um, with the snub, it it was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back because in years prior to that, you know, Roger and Me was a very popular documentary, didn't get nominated. Thin Blue Line, popular documentary, didn't get nominated. So I think there was this sense that, well, they can't possibly not nominate Hoop Dreams. I mean, with all the bad history they've had, and then they didn't, and so I think it just was like, okay, enough. You know, we have to do something about this. And Which is just interesting to think of the evaluative criteria, the way that award systems work, and then how that w ties into marketing as well. I think you have a microphone. I do, yeah. Um, big fan of the film. Uh, I was wondering, watching it this time, about uh, the use of voiceover, and uh, if you're always planning on using it, if you ever thought about not putting it in, um, where you decide to use it, where you held back. You mean narration? Yes. Like my narration? Yes. Yeah. We made a decision during the editing, um, when, I, when I got involved in the editing and we started um, through the past that, you know, kind of became the film, um, I started putting little bits of narration in just to push things along or just give you some information that I felt like you needed so that we could just move on. And... Um, we weren't, you know, we didn't start out with the idea that we'd have narration in the film, but it just, it, as we looked at it as it was evolving, and given how long the movie is, we just thought, you know, this helps, you know, instead of, instead of it being four hours without narration, it can be three hours with a little bit of narration or something, but, um, and we were going to get a professional narrator, but at, at a certain point, everyone just kind of said, well, you know, I think it's kind of good that it's not professional, that it's you, Steve, doing it, <laughs> and you'll just keep, you know, the idea of narration in this film is for it to be completely forgettable. You know, in fact, a lot of people, if they haven't seen the movie in a while, they, they will swear there's no narration in the movie, which is great. I love that because it, it's purely functional. I've done other films with no narration. Uh, At the Death House Door um, is a perfect example. The Interrupters has no narration, which I, uh, you all are required to come see. You know that, don't you? Tonight. Um, it's starting tonight, but it has no narration. But it just felt like this was a film, maybe if I made the film today with maybe a little better skills, we might have been able to circumvent it completely. But at the time, it was, it was, uh, it was purely a functional choice. And then I did a film after this called Stevie that has narration. And that was, that was definitely a choice to be made there because that was personal, a much more personal kind of narration which felt more you know, you know, organic to the story that was being told. Okay, so we have time for one more question. This person's been in darkness with the volunteer waving at me. Oh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. Uh, the question is, were you ever tempted um, to help 
the, the two families, like, during w their hardships, like, for example, when Arthur's parents, the lights went out. Right. Did you ever feel, like, tempted to say, okay, let me just slip them, like, $50 or 20 bucks? Like, I know it would have, um, it would not have been authentic because you wanted to tell a real story. And sure. Then, you know, but were you ever tempted? And the last part is, how attached did you get to these guys, like, right. attached? Yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question, you know, and it's that fundamental question in doc. one of the fundamental questions in documentary is, um, is where is that line? Uh, and, and, you know, and in journalism, and, you know, of course, in, in traditional journalism, you never would even consider that. It'd be like, well, of course, I'm not going to give money to them. I mean, I'm a journalist, and I'm just here capturing some reality that I'm going to report on. It gets trickier when you do a documentary like this and you establish relationships and you're with people for years. It gets a little trickier. And I don't think of myself as a journalist, actually. I, I think of myself as, I don't know, a nonfiction storyteller or something. I, I, I don't consider myself a journalist, so I don't feel as bound by those same rules. I, th I feel bound by a desire to tell some version of the truth that I perceive, because that's all I can do but I don't feel bound by certain rules. So for example, with the lights being turned off, um, I had to convince um, Sheila for, to let us come film that. She, she was like, it, it'll be embarrassing for us. And I said, you know, um, you know I, I understand that you feel that way, but I think that when people see this movie, that what they'll do is they'll understand some things that they didn't understand before by seeing what your family has gone through, that you've never had your power turned off, you've never been on welfare, and they have, there's a lot of stereotypes around that, and that this can just happen to anybody. And so she, she was convinced enough to let us come film it, and so we did film it, and then after we were done filming it, we pulled together the money to help them get the power turned back on, because we felt like that was the right thing to do. We felt like it was important that you see that it happened to them, but we also felt like, as people that were in their lives, to some degree that we had to, it, we, we, sh we needed to help um, them in, in that some small, modest way. We talked about whether to put that in the film or not, and we decided against it because we thought it would make it look like we were patting ourselves on our back, you know, saying, look what we did. And we didn't want that because we didn't feel like it was something to pat ourselves on the back about. It just felt like a, something we should do. So, um, and in some ways, a more interesting question would have been if, if we had been in a position to help Arthur stay at St. Joe's, should we have helped him stay at St. Joe's? And I, I, the reality is, is that he w that was during a period of time when we were filming very little and they had no phone and it was easy to lose touch with them. I had to literally go visit them to find out what was going on with them. And um, it happened, he was gone by the time I heard about it, which is why you don't see shots of him leaving school for the last day or whatever. Um, and, uh, but in thinking about it, it's like that would have been a much more difficult decision because if you then, if you start to give him money to help him stay at St. Joe's, then you have to say, okay, am I willing to help him stay at St. Joe's for the rest of his high school career? Are, are we ready to make that commitment? And if we are, then should we even be doing this film at that point? And we wouldn't have been in a position to do that, but it's an interesting question that we didn't have to even wrestle with because it happened and it was done and over with. In terms of the relationship to the guys, I mean, we became very close to them. And, um, and to the point, though, where, you know, like when things would happen to them, like I remember very distinctly when, when William missed the free throws junior year that caused the team to be eliminated, you know, they lost that game when he came back from the knee injury. Uh, I remember going to the parking lot after that game and just feeling like my younger brother had just lost this game that was so important to him, you know. I didn't think it was William's fault that they lost, but just feeling for him and this loss because he had such high expectations and not thinking about what he was feeling, blaming himself. And when William blew his knee out, I remember sitting in the doctor's office and thinking, because there was a time there where it seemed like it might be the end of his career, and thinking, you know, this is terrible what's happened to him. But to be perfectly candid, there was also this little voice in the back of my head saying that it, this is an incredibly dramatic development in this story. And I think that's one of the things you wrestle with when you make documentaries in general, and you particularly wrestle with them when you make them where you really get 
close to your subjects is, is that there, there are different junctures where you realize that as close as you are to them, you're still a filmmaker making a film about them. And uh, that's the hardest part of doing this work. There are many, many joys and pleasures. That's, the, for me, the hardest part. And any filmmaker who tells you they've got that figured out, it, it should either stop making films or they're lying to you. <laughs> so on that powerful note, I just want to mention to you that uh, Steve will be here to show The Interrupters tonight, tomorrow to show Real Paradise, and then his carte blanche pick, Slapshot. And then Sunday for Thanksgiving, uh, Stevie, his documentary. It's a heartwarming tale. <laughs> Thank you Perfect all. Perfect for the family. Um, thank you all for coming today, and please help me in thanking uh, Steve James for coming and showing his film.